This is Auto Line After Hours with John McElroy and Gary Vaslash, episode 575 for October 14th, 2021. Designing the Ford Maverick, inside and out. Watch Auto Line After Hours live at autoline.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. AutoLine After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey, and by Magna. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, you just heard John's voice. Um, John's not here for the show today, so... Um, He'll be back next week, so look forward to that. But we've got a great show for you, and I think you're really going to enjoy it. Um, first, let me introduce my journalistic colleague, Rain No from Core 77. Rain, how are you? Great. Thank you for having me, Gary. Good to see you back. And um, so, so give give the audience a, a quick, brief synopsis of Core 77. Sure. Uh, Core 77 is an industrial design news website. Uh, we've been around since the mid 90s, so quite a while. Uh, within the field of industrial design, auto design is kind of the neurosurgery uh, compared to, let's say, a regular doctor. So, auto designers are the best of the best, so we're always very excited to interview them. Mm -hmm. So, one of the reasons we have Rain on today is because our special guest is Scott Anderson, design manager at Ford. His most recent program is the Ford Maverick, which is just rolling out there. He did the Bronco Sport before that. He teaches at College for Creative Studies. He's worked at Rivian. He's worked at General Motors. He's worked at FCA. And he's just a guy who knows one hell of a lot about design. And I am so pleased to have you on the show today. Yeah, thank you very much, Gary. Uh, great to be here. Um, always fun to talk about design and especially the new Ford Maverick. So thanks for having me. So. So, so let's start it out by, by give us a sense of, you know, when you guys got the assignment, when you got the brief to do the Ford Maverick, what was it and what were you guys trying to accomplish? So we had this sort of um, new customer that we, who we had found during some research and I was on a different program entirely at the time and I, I got a kind of brief from my design chief said, hey, we're going to do this small compact pickup. And I just just about jumped out of my seat because... You know, my, one of my first cars is an original 94 Ford Ranger, right? The compact, compact truck. And I got really excited and enthused about doing something new in this space. And um, when I started reading the customer brief, it was a pretty exciting customer brief. They were energetic, sustainable, you know, value oriented, but wanted flexibility and customization and all these things that are talk, we, we talked about. And we boiled it down to some words like essential courage, right? make something super essential and something very courageous in the space. And I think Maverick fit, fits those bills really well. And so yeah, it was this very simple, like, Hey, we're going to do this really fast. It's going to be a six month program in and out for design. Right. So in January, I got the assignment. We formed our small team in the truck studio. And by July of that year, we were releasing final production services out to engineering to start making tools and, and uh, realize the production truck. So it was a very fast, uh, very low cost, very interesting um, customer assignment. So it's it a very exciting uh, part of my career, actually. So, so just before I Rain will ask you a question in a second, but I just want to know. So, so when you say you did this quickly, what is the length of a normal program? Typically, we'll see. I, I want to say it's around twelve to eighteen months of studio time. By the time you start to finish with all the gates and the different feedback loops and final production release, so um, roughly half uh, of the normal timing. Um, so a lot of the timing was was uh, truncated up in the front side of the design process. So the advanced studio had it for a very short few months, and then I got it as a production design team for about six months. That process normally is in anywhere from 12 to 18 months on a, on a regular program. Whether it's a new program or a top hat changes that as well, right? So an all new ground up is a little bit longer, but uh, a top hat goes a little shorter. You know, just a, you know another version of a, a current product is quite a bit shorter, but this was half of that even. So hmm. it's very, very fast. Rain. 
Okay. Uh, well, first I wanted to rave a little, a little about the interior. I'm assuming everybody watching this is hopefully familiar with the Maverick by now. If you haven't, uh, you can go back uh, on YouTube and see videos on it. There's a video of Scott uh, introducing some of the elements of the interior that we're looking at. Um, little details. I love the water bottle sizing in the door. Uh, the doors in the vehicles I have are sized to hold like a bar of soap or envelopes, uh, nothing useful. Um, I love the honesty of the materials, which you mentioned in the video. I mean, we all know it's plastic. It doesn't have to be, you know, made in full leather. Um, but you guys handled it in such a clean, modern way that, I mean, plastic is the right material for this application. Um, another little design detail that I really liked, uh, there's a product, a power tool company called Festool, and uh, some of their power tools are quite complicated. So anything you're supposed to interact with, they change the color. You've done the same thing with the car, with the touch points. They're all a different color. I thought that was a great, great detail. Um, and lastly, I love that FIT slot. I think it stands for Ford Integrated Tether. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know what it is, it's a little slot in the back of the center console. And uh, I think Ford said they were going to release 3D printed files so that you could print your own little accessory and slot it in there. I think by doing that, uh, assuming you guys are going after millennials, you have inadvertently or are going to spark a little Etsy ecosystem. People are going to start designing, making, and selling these little objects that fit into that FIT system. Um, so congrats to you and the design team. Yeah, uh, thank you, Rand. I'm glad you picked up on all these really important touch points of the program, right? Those were hypercritical, right? If we're going to take cost out and do it in a way that has a big personality, right? Utilizing the materials in an honest manner, gave us extreme flexibility in texturing, shaping, coloring that I think also helped us accentuate function to your point, right? So all the, the map pockets have the speckle, just the B-side map pockets just exposed to the customer. And we made that part of the design element, right? Put the facets up top and the bottle holders in it. And that just communicates visually how, you, how you're supposed to use the space, which makes it really simple for customers, right? It takes cognitive load out of their brain, puts in the environment around them, makes it much cleaner and simpler for them to use every single day. And I, I love the fit slot was something that came up um, really early on, Ford integrated tether system. We were starting to 3D print objects for the properties to have this really fast turnaround, you know, scrappy, quick mock-up. So we actually went to research with a bunch of 3D printed components. And we thought, geez, if we're making these super little modular pieces that we could take in and out to ask customers questions about how they want to use the space, what if we enable that sort of flexibility and customization in the actual production interior? And it, one thing led to another, and we thought about, yeah, exactly that. This little ecosystem would develop, you know, at a ground at a ground swell, people will talk to each other, share their ideas in the platform. And with the flex bed and the interior fit slot, both those things together make this super customizable space that was a huge insight from our customer research. You know, people want to make things their own. And, you know, just just the fact that there's this open source area of the vehicle to do that, we think will spring to your point an entirely new little business model, right? An Etsy shop and even a Ford supported shop where you, know, you can download the file. We'll give you some guidelines and a box to design within that makes sense for the scale of the, of the items you can put in the fit slot. And you'll be able to make your own or let's say have your friends print it or use a, a company that prints stuff for you, ships it to your house. Ideas that you'd end up snowballing out of support at the groundswell from the grassroots um, customer that says, hey, this is a platform that can make make whatever I want to do in my life available to me, right? Mm -hmm. Such a really important insight. So, so you guys thought that one of the audiences for this vehicle would be makers. And so not only do you have those... Um, capabilities on the inside, but the, you mentioned the flex bed and, and that mm -hmm. has also been designed with um, the ability to hack it as it were. 100%. Yeah. Yep. You can see here in the pictures, even all these little slots, right? These little detailed vertical slots and horizontal slots give you the ability to put, you know, tier loading two by fours and wood in, um, make your own features that work in those. We've even got you know, information when you do the QR codes on the bed and scan that. It takes you to a website showing DIY hacks you can make on your own for a bike rack, for side rails and storage. Because we understand these people, they might just be stretching to buy the Maverick in the first place, right? It might be their first vehicle, their first new vehicle. So they may not have a couple hundred bucks to throw together for a Yakima rack, right? So it's like, all right, let's give them the opportunity to make their own. And eventually they can buy the Yakima rack and they get some extra money together. But in the meantime, they can hack the vehicle to build whatever they need it to be at that given point in time. So we're joined by Mark Williams, um, freelance writer, truck guy extraordinaire. So welcome, Mark. 
and horribly embarrassed uh, human being. I should I should also say I, I apologize. I'm very sorry for getting in late. Not at all. No worries. So we, of course, are talking here with uh, Scott Anderson about all about the new Maverick design. Um, so ask away, Mark. Yeah, uh, Scott, thank you, obviously, for doing this and giving your time up. Um, can you talk to us a little bit what went into the thinking? Ford's always been very good about understanding uh, their truck buyers and specifically what kind of products they're trying to give them. Can you talk about the difference between a what a full-size pickup truck guy wants versus uh, a compact or a mid-size pickup truck guy? Yeah, absolutely. And we find we find there's three different. We have what's called archetypes at Ford. We do we do research where we go on to really look at deep learning and insight insights about that customer base, what their emotional states are, how they purchase, what kind of things they do in their lifestyle, and it tends to create a really solid picture of that person, that user, right? And that sort of represents the market space. So, with the Ford truck, it's about being the the hero, right? The the guy who builds your community, puts it together. Um, with the Ranger, it's a more of a rugged individual, somebody who's out there, you know, tasking themselves to do their best and had high adventure spaces. With the Maverick, that customer was a maker and a doer just starting out in their life, right? We call it the startup life, right? So like as a startup company, this is an upstart person, right? They're just getting into a business on their own. They're just starting their life out. They want something new and fresh and unique, and they have things and jobs to do but they're different kinds of things and jobs they do than a full-size truck customer, mid-size truck customer might take on, right? So this, we found it's a more urban buyer. They might be living in an apartment complex or a condo downtown, but they like to get out and do kayaking on the weekend or climbing or hiking or through do electric biking or whatever it happens to be. Or they're starting a small business. They wanna be able to haul things around in the inner city and be have a parkable solution, right? something that fits in, let's say, downtown Portland or LA very easily, New York City, for example, they can get out into the woods and take their bikes with them, right? So we definitely have these archetypes and they have similar overtones as a Ford brand, right? They're all about building their community, helping their community out as a truck buyer, but the level and the, of the work they do is, is quite a bit different and the focus is quite a bit different of the work they do. Interesting. Um, so it kind of sounds like you're describing this buyer for the Maverick as not necessarily a truck person, but you're you're helping create a truck person. Is the right. is the the interior doing that specifically, and and how? Absolutely. So we we always like to say the Maverick is a truck for the person who ever knew they needed a truck, right? So if you got a person who might be today buying a small hatchback or a vehicle or SUV or car or crossover. And they look at the Maverick and go, geez, that's, you know, 40 plus miles per gallon. It's $20,000. Oh, and it happens to have this four and a half foot box in the back. I could do all kinds of stuff with I never thought about before, right? So that person now that usually is limited in compromising their solution based on fuel economy or price, they don't get the scale and the footprint they need. Or, you know, maybe they have a, a truck desire or a bent to get a truck, but they, they live in a spot where it's, they need a tiny footprint, a parkable solution. So... We think the Maverick is an all new place to be for Ford truck and it's an exciting one, frankly. On the interior side, this idea of undersea cargo storage, um, flexibility of the space to go from people to cargo even on the inside. One big insight of trucks is the interior is just as much as a cargo hold as the exterior bed, right? You look at all the spaces people put big screen TVs in the back of their F-150, we brought that insight to Maverick and said, look, these people are gonna be carrying mountain bikes inside possibly, um, precious cargo like their children, drones, devices, sporting equipment, you know, baseballs, uh, golf clubs. Those, some of those things are really expensive. They don't want to put them out in the bed, so they want them secured and lockable. So that's what the interior cargo space does in the back seat. In the front, we queued in on some classic pickup truck themes, right? Cross car emphasized instrument panel, lots of width and space inside. Um, even the console is low and at the same height as the seat cushion. So. You know, when you look across that interior, it looks and feels like an old school bench seat truck on the inside, right? There's lots of space for your knees to spread out, lots of space for your stuff and equipment. And, you know, you bring stuff with you like water bottles and phones and truckers are all about being prepared to drop of a hat to do anything they want to do, the, anything they want to do next or to help other people do their thing next, right? So 
having that ultimate flexibility to go from one thing to another quickly and make that transition is how we design the interior space to support the truck lifestyle. Right. Thank you. Uh, let's see. So I w for those of you that haven't seen the interior uh, or taken a good look at it, the armrest along the door is very unusual in that the middle section has been removed and the door handle is just sort of free floating. Mm -hmm. When you watch the video of Scott describing this process, he's saying, yeah, you know, we're in the studio one day. We just decided we're just going to cut this. But Scott, I looked at your your resume. First of all, is there a car company you didn't work for? It's like all of the big three, Mercedes, Jaguar. I'm scrolling through this list expecting to see, you know, Skoda, Vault. Anyway, I'm sure you know there's some design studios where you suggest something that radical and then you're escorted out by security carrying your stuff in a box. <laughs> what kind of leeway did you guys have over there that this was a, an idea that was possible? So, yeah, that's what's really great about the Maverick program in general. Is it was a very fast, co-located, collaborative team, right? So um, in the studio, I was fortunate enough to work for a chief and a director that gave me a lot of latitude and flexibility, right, to be creative. Um, and two important words we talked about at the beginning here, essential and courage. Uh, Jim Farley himself came down and said, look, give me two words that represent the program, design around those two words, right? Let's make this something really punchy and big. So we said, okay, essential, which means, you know, simple but not basic, pared down, you know, supporting your startup life, entrepreneurial spirit, and then courageous, you know, having the courage to do to strike out on your own, be a maverick, do your own thing, um, and do something new and different and fresh. So those two words drove every decision we made, right? So we had a lot of latitude with our design team specifically, but also the engineering team was very collaborative and supportive of being creative. Um, they knew that we had a tight timeline, a tight budget. We didn't have a lot of opportunity to just add content to make the value, right? So we had to find unique and special ways to make that value. And the things we started looking at were the insight of bottles, sustainability. People didn't want to have disposable drinks anymore. They wanted their own metal bottles. And even things like, I want to bring my mountain bike along, but it's $5,000 e-bike, and I don't want to put it in the bed and be insecure. So, you know, cutting that armrest away gave us space for bottles, but also a tire fits door to door on a 26 inch mountain bike cross car and you can take the front tire off and still fit your mountain bike in the back and the tire slides in that space. So we were looking at those things people were doing and said, geez, if we actually cut this armrest out, we could fit a taller bottle in the door, but also maybe in the back seat, we could fit a bike. And so I grabbed one of my um, colleagues bikes. We had a sort of pile of bikes in the back of the studio that people were modifying, working on for fun on their lunch hour. So I grabbed one of those bikes. We went over to the mock-up and said, geez, this actually fits. If you cut this armrest away, this bike will fit in the back seat, right? Wow. So now we've got this opportunity to make this super secured storage space for your really expensive, you know, mountain bike that for some people, before they bought their Maverick, that might be the biggest purchase they've ever made, right? Mm -hmm. So we looked at those really deep learnings from our customer and said, how can we make this life better for them? How can we make the platform flexible for them? And those moments of freedom and flexibility in the studio space were really, really enlightening, and encouraging. Um, and our management sort of just stepped aside and let's get our job done, which is really nice um, and, and, and um, you know empowering, frankly. Scott, you mentioned in passing. Um, so, so this this truck starts at under twenty grand, mm -hmm. and I mean that that's one important thing. The other important thing is is that the standard, the base engine, is a hybrid. Yes. And, you know, it's it's turning, you know, 40 MPGs. Um, one of our viewers, uh, D Mix, says, you know, that, that's very attractive. Um, another another viewer, Tom Miller, says Ford knocked it out of the park. So a little props to you guys there. Um, so I've got to ask you. So, so you know, Chief Engineer Chris Mazur, I mean, he he's the guy who has to figure out the, you know, the ways and means of, of making this thing um, happen in the real world. Um, when you were developing the interior, um, you know, Rain mentioned that, you know, using plastic materials in a very honest way, in a very clever mm -hmm. way, I might add. Um, were you guys under a, a real price pressure or did you look at that as an opportunity to do something that really hadn't been done before in trucks? I mean, it, it's extraordinary, I think, you know, as, as Rain mentioned, um, you know, the, the the ways that you guys have, have gone at this that you just don't see that in in vehicles today so yes and yes right so <laughs> to answer your question yeah it was it was a very big price challenge right and the platform it came from the cars are much more expensive in that platform so first of all we had to bring some parts from other platform mates right certain systems were were, were care were reutilized 
And we saw this as an opportunity. Like we looked at a lot of small vehicles around the globe and how they handle the lower price points. And the first thing you notice is color, texture, changes to the plastic. And we said, you know, what I really have always loved about the product design world is that when you look at things like Bose headphones or um, Nike shoes, they're celebrating the materials for what they are, right? They're not trying to tell you it's leather. It's not faking it, right, to make it. So we say, hey, we're going to produce some value here at this price point. Let's look at other consumer conscious, value conscious products around the globe and see how they're handling it. And the first thing we notice is these big colors and personalities and the plastics and textures and said, and for me as a designer, like I'm a very pragmatic designer. My my whole background sets me up for that, right? So I've always liked and appreciated the thought of honesty in materials because consumers are intelligent enough to understand the difference between leather and plastic. So quit lying to them, right? Quit, quit creating a false economy and a false value in, a, in a, an animal grain, right? Nobody, nobody believes for a minute that polypropylene is leather. So quit pretending it is, right? So that gave us a huge opportunity to take a lot of money out and do reductive design process as well. So um, the speckled plastic is a reground carbon. It's also a sustainability story as part of the process. Reductive design is sustainable. Like I have a big thesis about design for manufacturing leading to sustainability, right? The fewer, the part that doesn't exist is the lightest is a lotus mantra, but like it's also the cheapest part, right? So if you can make two parts do one, one part do two jobs or three jobs or double down on how the function works, you know, for example, the mat pocket in the doors is also the trim decorative bolster above the armrest, right? Those are one part now. The D7 instrument cluster binnacle that usually just connects the, the instrument panel to the cluster. I exposed that part and poked it through the instrument panel. So it's a visual color break and it made a cool design at the same time, right? And that was all enabled by die tipping it the right way to get the grains the right way, right? So we worked really hard with engineering compartment. Uh, uh, compatriots, I'll call them, that helped us create those value pieces in a way that was unique. The, the, the registers are two-shot overmold, dual-shot plastic. So you inject the black part and you inject the orange part in front of it in the same tool, in the same cavity at the same time, right? So I'm not paying for a painted process in there. I'm actually paying, paying for one injection mold tool with a little bit extra pressure in it to make that dual shot. So those are, but I, you know, I made a simple square vent um, that was, you know, orthogonal facing the direction of flow. And we negotiate with engineering teams on, okay, let's do this kind of vent that's really low cost. It's okay, well, give me something to make it have a nice look to it. So how about we do a dual shot vein? It's a perfect, and then we'll make all the veins identical, right? So it drops the cost of every vein down to nothing. And the value comes in the color accent, which is also giving it a, a, a interface point, right? At the same time, communicating interface points. So those are examples where I had this really good chemistry in the team and it was really exciting. Scott, there were so many uh, surprising little details in the interior. And you mentioned that you guys had done heavy research in the beginning with this new uh, demographic. When you were gaining your insights from them, was there anything that you learned from them that really surprised you? Yeah, I, I think I, I didn't realize how much customization goes on in the market. You know, you've been told forever it's important, but then you think, well, geez, you know, I don't see a whole lot of people doing radical customization. You know, the people, in, in, uh, you always hear about people just buy a car and drive it, turn it back in. It's a commodity, right? Then you just see little touches, like something as simple as putting like Batman logo floor mats in, or I made a little foam board and a bungee cord to hold my surfboard in the back of this small SUV. And people are kind of like life hacking at an incredible rate out there, right? They're doing things on their own because they're not served, served or satisfied by products that are already in the market. So we learned a lot about how people were customizing at a very rudimentary level, even the smallest details they were changing to make the car feel like theirs. And we said, okay, that's a big insight. Um, and just because they wanted something simple didn't mean they wanted something basic and cheap, right? So we sort of saw this affinity for lower cost products in the customer base, but they were really generally enamored by them and endearing to them, right? They liked them. So they got a, they got a bond and a connection to them. And when I noticed what they were picking out for things they liked, it was things of a really big personality, but a low cost, right? So little headsets or earphones or, you know, socks or, you know, eyeglasses, things that they were you know, buying consciously, but they were choosing lower cost things that were more, more uh, reflective of their personality, right? And 
So that, that was a huge surprise and delight insight. And we, we saw like, hey, this is a really cool opportunity. You know, at first it was kind of like people are saying, geez, you know, you got no money, you got no time. How are you gonna make a cool interior on this project, right? And I said, challenge accepted, right? Let's go. <laughs> design. <laughs> it's design, right? That's what we do in design, right? That's part of our job. So, you know, literally creating value out of thin air, right? So it was really exciting to see the customers were there with us, right? They were they were show, showcasing their affinity for lower cost product in general and things with big personality. And, you know, we did a lot of things that were super controversial, like the cutaway armrests, the exposed fasteners, the colors, even the textures were not normal for business at the time. And it was kind of controversial to put that into the system. But then I just kept going back to those words, essential and courage. We need to be courageous and take a big leap here or no one will look there. Don't no turn their head twice. Right. We want people to turn their head twice take a double take at it, right? So having that big statement was important. And I think that was where I was excited to be supported by our team and really surprising to see the customers like loving these low cost products and how, how cool they could possibly be. So that was fun. Mark. Uh, Gary knows this about me. I love hearing designers talk about their vehicles. There's so much enthusiasm and passion that comes through in everything that you're talking about. But let, let me pull back a little bit. This is a, a, a unibody chassis. There are vehicles out mm -hmm. there, the Honda Ridgeline. We can think about the Ford Explorer Sport Track. We can think about the Subaru Brat. We know that the Hyundai Santa Cruz is out there. Um, those, those don't have a separated bed. Truck guys are going to look at the word hybrid, CVT. They're going to look at the word unibody and they're going to look at that dial for their transmission and not instantly think about hardcore truck work. Are you trying to train SUV buyers to be comfortable with a bed or are you going to try to do something different than Honda has tried to do and, and even Ford has tried to do in the past? I think it's important to understand that no matter what platform we get truck from for built for tough truck design there's there are metrics and standards we produce right so for every ounce of payload every ounce of towing we design into that truck it has a built for tough test regimen so i think the difference for us especially is that we have 100 years of truck expertise and experience in the market we're leveraging that to bear on this product even though it is unibody and it's a smaller footprint truck and a smaller capability than an f-series it's still very much a built for a tough product and went through, as Chris Major mentioned, over 19 million miles of testing to bear that out, right? So the other benefit is that platform that you're talking about, C2 is our flexible vehicle architecture. And that thing's been through three product cycles already. All those accumulated miles start out the Maverick. And then on top of that, we put built for tough testing and yet again. So there's elements that Honda won't do and can't do, doesn't understand in the Ridgeline, right? There's elements that other products may you know, that may be unibody trucks that they don't have that sort of understanding of that truck testing and regimen and durability that, that Ford does, right? So every ounce of trucks built for a tough, right? And again, it's it's a truck for people that didn't know they needed a truck, right? So it's a, it's a new space, a new market, a new customer. If you want, you know, 11,000 pounds of towing, you buy an F-Series, right? If you want, you know, 7,800 pounds of towing, you buy a Ranger, you want 4,000 pounds of towing for those couple of jet skis you just bought or that small boat or a camper, Maverick is a good fit, right? You got you to fit a tight parking spot, get 40 plus MPG, it's the right product for you. So we designed the capability built for tough around the, around the user and the premise what they're going to use it for. Okay, I'll ask the last one. All right. So, so Scott, you've talked a lot about various aspects of the vehicle. You spent a lot of time developing it, soaking in it, driving it, living with it. What's your favorite aspect of the new Maverick? Oh, man, it's so hard. It's a hard question. There's so many little details. I, I think I still think my favorite thing is the fact that um, we got these really courageous elements in the interior design, like the, the exposed fasteners to me is probably my number one favorite because we actually have a FORD bolt now. <laughs> in the system at Ford Motor Company that I can use on other projects later. Um, and it sort of inspired and worked with the Bronco team on their bolts. It was kind of a an energy momentum gaining behind it. And I think that's a example of how passion and design focus and customer driven design can 
end up giving you something completely new and, and different than you would have thought never happened in the, in the interior space before. So that bolt represents a lot of sort of new thinking, right, about how you how you put a truck together. So I think that's probably my favorite. It, it is a very cool bolt. And for people who don't quite get it, it's, it actually does say Ford on the outside of it. So it's not just like it's exposed. It's like, oh, they guys, they, they forgot to finish this. But no, it, 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 is a, it is an integral part of the design. So Scott Anderson, want to thank you very much for spending some time with us today. And we really appreciate it. So yeah, thank you guys. Thanks for having me. This has been fun. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to take thank a you, quick break and uh, hear from our friends at Bridgestone and Magna. And we'll be right back to talk more about design and trucks. And we are back with Rain No, of course, 77, and Mark Williams, uh, freelance writer, uh, often about trucks. So I've got to ask you, have, so have you guys seen and or driven the Maverick? Sadly, I was not in the national event. I have not been able, all I've done is been able to look at it from afar. So, yeah, I'm waiting. Mm -hmm. I'm dying to uh, to try it out. Yeah, yeah I, I've I, got I, some tests to throw at it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you do, but uh, yeah, the the interior of that that vehicle really is quite amazing. I mean, yeah. it's it's uh, it, it, it's a pleasant surprise. Um, you know, it, it it seems to me that the exterior design is is more or less like, honey, I shrunk the F one hundred and fifty, and you know, it has that that more you know trucky look, and then you get inside it, and I mean, it's it's like a revelation. It's like something that you've not seen before, which is which is you know just just amazing. Um, I think really this like is that. a case of, and I haven't seen it in person, so I'm just going by images, but it's a case of where the interior, to me, outshines the exterior. I don't dislike the exterior. I look at it like a competent movie, like they didn't screw anything up. It's That's right. But uh, the interior, and I just have to point out how nuts six months is. I mean, I'm hoping you guys have an inkling. <laughs> that's crazy. He and his team, nobody slept well for yeah. those six months. So they, if you guys are watching this, congratulations. So, 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 so do you think it was excitement or Red Bull? <laughs> Probably a little both. Mm -hmm. Probably both. Yeah. So if, I, if I know if I know those team members, then uh, they probably fought like heck to get on that team, and then uh, they had a very clear vision of what they wanted to do. You don't execute something like that without understanding, and maybe even being able to point back. And we didn't get him to go on the record, but. There's got to be some frustrated projects he's worked on in the past that finally were allowed to come out in this vehicle. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark, I wanted to ask you something since you're uh, a truck guy. Um, so I'm to explain, uh, I'm newly a truck guy. I'm living in a very rural county, uh, less than 25,000 people, no stoplights. Everybody's got a truck and it's, it's not an option. You need a truck <laughs> if you have any amount of land. Um, sure. And they are these, oh, one thing I, they're these surprisingly communal objects. I'm a guy who moved down here from New York City. I didn't know anything about trucks. After getting a truck and then meeting neighbors, we've all borrowed each other's trucks. A transmission goes out, you, yeah, take my truck, you take my trailer. Um, what I've seen a lot of down here is a lot of people have these very prized little Mazda, Mitsubishi, old Nissan, pre Tacoma, Toyota, small pickups. They won't sell them to you. They love these things. Nobody's making them anymore. They're low to the ground. Um, they don't have a huge payload, but that's not what they're for. You know, there's a guy, uh, he, he's a full-time fence guy at a farm. All he does is drive the fence line every day, five days a week and fixes it. All he needs is the Toyota with fence posts, a couple tools. Do you think that something like the Maverick will appeal to these rural drivers or? Uh, eventually, um, what, what you've experienced and the experience you've just described is not unusual. It's, uh, very familiar to me 
because it's a very familial, uh, family-oriented way of thinking. You've now moved into their community. You've inhabited their family area. So you are going to be accepted as part of their family, just like the vehicles they own are part of their family. Why would you think they would sell one of their family members to somebody else? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense to me. I wouldn't do that. Yeah. They don't expect you to do that, but they will let you I think borrow it's illegal. and Just, use the work. Yeah, yeah it's illegal too. <laughs> I totally understood. But yeah, especially those vehicles that have been around, been abused, uh, have stories to tell. All you have to do to kill an afternoon is to ask somebody about how how you almost died with that truck, and you will get several stories about any any vehicle that they own. But but now the, the, the mentality is not like that. And, and truck people who really appreciate build quality, uh, they, they enjoy decades with their vehicles, not just years or seasons. So if, if this vehicle is going to do well on the build quality side, the same way that we can see the passion shine through Scott when he talks about the design side, that's always the trick. Uh, anybody can get up here and give a couple of months worth of great interviews. But if we come back here in 10 years, are we still talking about the Maverick? That that will determine a lot about whether or not people are going to keep that vehicle around. Hmm. All right. So so for most of the uh, viewers of, of After Hours know that the second half of the show is generally dedicated to news, but I'm going to try to do something different because I got these two guys here. So design truck guy and design guy who owns a truck. So, you know, this is all good. So, so what I want to do is I want to walk through the announced electric trucks that are coming out. Okay. And so we'll have images of these things. We'll walk, we'll walk through them. And I, I want to get your reaction. Both of you guys get your reaction to these trucks and, you know, and, and look at it from the point of view of, you know, um, why do they exist? Who's going to want them? Does anybody want them? Um, what do you like about it? What do you think they're missing with it? And just, just, we'll, we'll see how this goes. We've never, we've never tried this before, but you know, <laughs> what the hell we'll give it a shot. Okay. So first one, the Ford F-150 Lightning. Now, this is a said to be a 563 horsepower, 775 foot-pounds of torque, 2,000 pound payload in the standard range model, um, maximum 10,000 pounds towing capacity. They have something called Intelligent Backup Power, which provides an available 80 amp Ford Charge Station Pro and home management system Ford can help install to keep your house running for up to three days. Um, so what do you guys think? Ford F-150 Lightning. Oh. Rain, do you want to go first? You go first, please. It's incredible. It's incredible. I mean, just the, the frunk alone, uh, the amount of things I could store in there. Um, I'm on a chicken farm. Half the job is just moving things from one end of the mm -hmm. property to the other. Uh, there's so many things I would like to do with an electric truck. But, well, I guess I should save this for when we talk about electric trucks in general. But the Ford F-150, I think... Um, they're the like a, an electric Silverado like an electric F-150. They've got the best shot of converting like an actual truck user, right? I mean, somebody who's actually using the truck. It's not a lifestyle vehicle. It actually is a tool, right? Uh, the only thing that would scare me about electric truck, at least in a rural area, um, is the range um, and the infrastructure. Uh, the standard range is 230 miles. Uh, the extended range is 300. Okay. And, and I can see Mark is very skeptical about this. <laughs> Uh, I totally agree with Ray in that um, Ford has done a pretty, pretty good job of at least considering that traditional truck buyer that they've literally made the look of the truck identical to a normal or regular uh, F-150, right? The, the things that are going to stand out to truck guys uh, specifically are, is the independent rear suspension, that, that's going to be a question mark. Uh, Ford has done a, a, what I consider to be a genius thing by trying to distract, well, distract by giving you an amazing performance vehicle uh, from the traditional 
truck kind of work envelope that they could normally do. So, so if you're going to use that lightning name, everybody knows what lightning means, power and for performance and supercharge capability, all that stuff. And now Ford is, you know, taking that supercharge capability and evolved the definition of that word. And now I think there's going to be a place for it. But when you make four or 500 or six hundred thousand f-150s a year you can slice off twenty thousand thirty thousand fifty thousand maybe are they going to sell as many lightnings as they sell raptors i doubt it but maybe there's a a first adopter group out there that doesn't hate pickup trucks i don't know a lot of first adopter electric guys out there hate pickup trucks so i don't i don't see them coming over and buying an electric f-150 but the performance guys, I, I think there's a lot of people that are thinking that the future of high performance isn't that 67 Camaro lookalike with a new Corvette engine, but it's a maybe a pickup truck with an electric powertrain that smokes everything that they can take to the local racetrack on the Saturday or, or Friday or Saturday night. All right. So, so, so you see this as being something that is not going to be used to haul stones or mulch or what have you and it's going to be something that people are going to say hey this will be great i've got a performance vehicle yeah i i think i think the first step is going to be performance vehicle i totally think that ford's doing the right thing by trying to uh calm people's fears by throwing the airstream on the back of it or showing all the things you can carry in it or you know talking about payload but payload capacity anybody that understands a pickup truck with coil rear springs and rear sag and what that does to your driving dynamics around the corner, they're going to be a little suspicious. They're going to be, let me wait a couple of years and see what happens kind of thing. They're not going to be the first ones plunking down a deposit at a local, a local dealer. Okay. So before we move on, um, Scott Anderson left a little, little note for us pointing out that there are are 120,000 plus pre-orders for the Ford Lightning. So obviously there are fans out there for that. Um, okay, so the next one we'll move on to is the Rivian R1T. Now this says it can tow up to 11,000 pounds with the bed, the frunk, the rear storage bin, the under seat storage, the center console and the gear tunnel. There's over 62 cubic feet of storage. So, so rain, there's some storage for you. Um, there is something, a gooseneck hinge on the tailgate will allow the bed length to go to 83.9 inches. It's got a um, rated range of 314 miles. And it, and it seems that Rivian is basically saying, okay, we're, we're going for the REI crowd. We're going for the outdoor people. We're not going necessarily for, for rain. So oh. what do you think about that one, Rain? I think it's hilarious, the Rivian. I mean, I, don't get me wrong. I think RJ Scaringa is trying to do the right thing. I believe in his mission. But this is not, it could tow 11,000 pounds. I don't think the guy that's going to buy the Rivian has ever trailed anything uh, or is going to be needing to pull that much weight. This is more, I see it as for like Silicon Valley tech guys to put their carbon fiber surfboard and drive to Monterey. It doesn't seem like a, a truck to me. I mean, the tunnel through the back is kind of cool. But what does that do to the bed? And we should ask the truck guy. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be you, know, you, Mark. Ray, and I think you've uh, hit the nail on the head. I, I think this is going to make a certain type of vehicle buyer that has a stable of vehicles in his custom garage happy, and, and he'll love driving it. But it's, uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I totally admire CEOs that have the ty type of... Um, energy and desire to want to change and mix things up. Uh, to a certain extent, almost everybody in this electric pickup truck segment is somebody who wants to be Elon Musk. They're, they're all trying to be the disruptor to the auto industry and change everything. And none of them are changing everything. They're all kind of doing the same thing with the same segment, which is kind of interesting. But the, uh, I, I don't see this vehicle being anything but an extension of exactly what you would expect if you have a whole bunch of McLaren refugees and Tesla refugees coming together and building a vehicle. 
they they've done an amazing design job. Oh, yeah, I do have to say the design is beautiful. Oh, yeah. all, right, all right, so so okay, is it a truck? No, how much is it? Co well, I guess there's other trucks in that price point. Um, yeah, like the one we'll get to next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it, it it's 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 tricky. I mean, you. you I, mean, I, I'm sure there's plenty of analogies that very intelligent people can come up with, but I mean, there's the, there's the core of what a pickup truck is. And Rain said it earlier. It's a tool that has to do a bunch of different things, and that just does not seem um, to be the highest priority on any of these vehicles. They're very cool, and they can do things that some vehicles have never been able to do before, and that has value. I, I, I'm not. To, you know, disparaging anything about that. That absolutely is an amazing thing to watch these types of, of engineering feats come to fruition. But, but as far as, you know, where it actually has to be practical and not just cater to celebrities or actors and actresses, I, I, I don't know. I, for me, I, I, I just have to stand back and watch. All right, so, so, so the next one is an absolute feat of engineering and it undoubtedly will have appeal to at least actors. The Hummer EV pickup from GMC. So they're talking about a thousand horsepower and 11,500 foot pounds of torque. It's got uh, E four wheel drive, meaning electric uh, three motors, um, five foot box on the back. Um, Rain, what do you think about that? I mean, this is an astonishing piece of design and um, maybe a, a little tidbit that'll clue you guys into who they're going after. Did you guys ever see any of the, um, the Avengers or Marvel movies uh, mm -hmm. where they've got some computer scientist or Tony Stark and he's always got some cool 3D interface that's like a bunch of glowing orbs and they tapped the design company that did those interfaces for the movie to design the interior UX and UI for the Hummer. Um, they're going after Tony Stark, that's the market. <laughs> Uh, for this for this vehicle, I love the fact that Ford and GM think exactly alike, uh, and, and I'm being completely and 100% sarcastic. I, 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 okay, we have the Ford Lightning. Everybody knows what that was, and now we're trying to redefine what that Ford Lightning is because the world is different, technology is different, yet we're trying to repackage and market the exact same thing. For who, we'll, we'll find out. But here we have GM doing exactly the same thing, not, not even trying to pretend something. You're taking Hummer, which everybody exactly understood and knew what Hummer was, but now they're trying to rebrand it and remarket it shoving all this technology inside of it to say, oh, now it's something completely different. That, that, that's, that's difficult for, look, I'm an old gray bearded man. I totally get and understand that. And I have a long memory and, and in some ways I have a very, very short memory, but with words like Hummer and words like lightning, you're gonna have to do more than just remarket and repackage something with new technology to get me to start thinking about it being very interesting. So, so here's the thing that I wonder about this in particular is, okay, so there, there'll be an SUV version coming out as well, which which basically is, is the same vehicle, but without the box on the back. What do you guys imagine will be carried in the box on the back besides, I don't know, meteors or whatever comes uh, Thor's ice. hammer. I mean, I don't know. Uh, luggage. It, it's going to be luggage and uh, maybe camping gear or stuff to bring to the kids' school event that's happening down on the baseball field or anything. I, I just can't imagine that anybody is going to use that kind of uh, I'll apologize before I even say this, but a, a pretend bed like, like the Hummer is offering. Obviously, the F-150, it's a different situation, but still they have a compromise that they're making with those coil springs. Anybody who understands pickup trucks and carrying heavy loads, even in a, a full-size or mid-size SUV, 
extra weight, a few hundred pounds of extra weight in the rear of a vehicle changes everything about how you have to look down the road, behind you, what turns you're making. And you if if and if you're talking about a trailer, which even is an exponential jump to that, it it's even more important that you understand that you have a vehicle that can accommodate that. Extra weight to an electric vehicle is an extra drain. So push all that those numbers about range right out the window. Because if it's hot or if it's too cold or if you don't have a plug in 50 miles and you're towing something that maybe you shouldn't be towing or you didn't know you were gonna be towing, bad things could happen in your brain and that anxiety is real. All right, so, so the next one, and, and this one, I, I am really going to be interested in, in Rain's reaction to this one. And um, uh -oh. because it's, um, well, <laughs> I we'll see why. <laughs> so the Bollinger B2. Oh, okay. 614 horsepower, 668 foot-pounds of torque. Um, it's got a payload, and this is a curious one, and, and maybe Mark can explain this. The payload is 5,001 pounds. <laughs> And it has 7,500 uh, pound towing. The bed is four feet wide and six feet long, and it can be yours for a mere $125,000. So, okay. <laughs> rain, start. So this is interesting. I actually love this. Um, I know it's the same price as the Hummer, but I don't resent it. And well, first of all, a couple of things. I don't care what my truck looks like. I don't even care what color it is. I, I don't care about the aesthetics. I'm not looking at it. I'm inside of it. Um, the, this is the only electric truck I've seen that's been honest about what can you do with this platform? And they made that crazy tunnel that goes all the way through between the front seats so that you can carry stuff in there or access it. And the fact that the back wall folds down and now the bed goes inside the cabin, these are all brilliant, brilliant features. Um, I, I just wish they could mass produce it and make it affordable. I mean, if I could afford the, one of these, I'd get it in a heartbeat. I think it's amazing. <laughs> and it was invented by a guy living on a farm designed right. specifically for his tasks. That's what I love about it. And I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I think Rain's, Rain's more of a truck guy than he is letting on because I totally agree with him 100% about just the sheer brute force of this thing. No, no, this is a no apology design, no apology engineering is got. If you just look at the door hinges on that thing, or even even the way the 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 plugs that they offer, the three prong plugs that they offer, both in the front and the back, it, absolutely well done for engineering, making it as heavy duty and as strong and as durable as possible. And and the design itself is without any regard to wind resistance, right? It's just this beautiful, solid slab siding, front, back, side, top, bottom, and heavy. When you slam a door on, on that B2, nothing sounds like that. And it sounds just phenomenally safe and secure. And, and that's essentially what you want when you're shelling out, I guess, that much money for something. You want to have something that'll at least survive a bomb blast or a crash into something. Something else is going to lose if you ever get into an accident with a B2. But, but yeah, but they've stayed perfectly true to exactly the three box shape, which they don't need to because it's an electric vehicle. Why would you need a front hood like that unless you wanted to use it for cargo? But yeah, the the engine compartment in front, the passenger thing in the middle, and the bed area in the back. That's what a pickup truck has been for 125 years, and that's exactly what Bollinger is giving us now with just a different propulsion system. Okay. You guys seem to like that one more than any of the ones we've <laughs> talked about so far. That's true. <laughs> All right. So so this one we, we, we don't have a picture of because picture doesn't exist. The Silverado Electric. Mm -hmm. um, now, according to General Motors and, and, and Mark Royce at their Investor Day program last week emphasized this, and I think he was trying to throw some shade on Ford, basically saying, this is designed as an EV from the ground up. This isn't an existing platform that we're sticking an EV into. Um, basically, um, it's got a fixed glass, fixed glass roof. Um, they're going to have four-wheel steering on this. Um, an uh, estimated range of more than 400 miles. Um, I think they're just building a, a pickup truck. So um, 
is 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 this just a line extension? Is this something that that General Motors is going to do to basically say, you know, we've got a full suite, you can come to us instead of those other guys? Either of you? Mm. Mm. <laughs> uh, All right, moving right along. <laughs> I can start just but just by saying that. Um, I'm not surprised that GM is being very cautious about this. And, and I, I sincerely hope that what he means is that it isn't just going to be a repackaged and rebranded Hummer electric vehicle that Chevy is going to throw a pickup body on top of. Although, even if they did that, uh, the Chevy truck guy remembers the SS, remembers big blocks, remembers... Uh, high performance and power. So if they wanted to go that angle and it would be just a niche vehicle kind of thing, I think they could pull that off if they wanted to stay in that kind of um, Ford patterned path of performance vehicle making a pickup truck uh, with that kind of package. But, but Again, it's it's either Ford being me too, or it's GM being me too in this situation. So I, I don't know if anybody wins, and I don't know if any, either one of them can throw shade on either, either brand. But I guess I don't know enough, enough that, about this. Uh, well, I don't know enough about this specific model. Uh, all I know is that the the brand loyalty I've observed makes me think that Ford or Chevy stands the best chance of turning a traditional truck owner just based on the name. Um, I mean, a Rivian is never going to get those guys, right? Um, and maybe it will have appeal for fleets. I don't know. Hmm. The, the thing that I think is is perhaps telling about this is that the vehicle will have its official introduction at CES. Oh, that's so, telling. Yeah. <laughs> so, so um, all right. Moving right along to quite possibly the most controversial design statement in the 21st century. The, yes, indeed, Rain, the, the Tesla Cybertruck. Now, the, the Cybertruck is made out of something called ultra hard 30 X cold rolled stainless steel. And it has Tesla armor glass, which I guess, as we saw at the presentation, <laughs> um, um, is, is not exactly um, armor. Instead of a bed, it has a 6.5 6, 6 foot vault. The single motor right rear wheel drive version can tow 7,500 pounds. The dual motor all wheel drive version, 10,000 pounds. In the tri motor all wheel drive, 14,000 pounds. The range for those respectively is 250 miles, 300 miles, 500 miles. So, so Rain, you, you were, you, you looked hurt when I pained, as it were. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, well, design-wise, it's it's an abomination. I think uh, they should put spikes on the side to reinforce that you not only cannot reach over the sidewall, but you shouldn't try. Just, I mean, it's like a joke from a Mike Myers movie, like a prop you would see in the background. And like, oh, God, look, at somebody made. I, I just can't believe that it's actually going to come out. Uh, I agree with Rain. Um, I, 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 I did happen to check, uh, a non-disclosure agreement that I had to sign that I know has now run out. So I can actually talk about seeing this vehicle before anybody saw it revealed to the world. Um, it was working with Motor Trend and, and had a chance to go in and with a group of people, uh, they were going to show us the very first cardboard setup that they had of this vehicle. It wasn't anything built, but it was the shape and it was the size. Um, and, and they escorted us in and they had the Ram 1500, I think it was a Lariat. And then they had the F-150 in the other back corner and they had the Chevy Silverado on the other side. Um, and they had this thing sitting right in the middle. And when we walked in, they said, well, what do you think? And I, well, what do you think about what? Well, what, what do you think about our, you know, our design? And I, I just said, yeah, yeah, show, show me the truck. I, I don't even see it. And I literally did not even, it was sitting right in the middle in between those three trucks of a big, you know, stadium design room. And I did not see it. And then once he said it was there and that those are the wheels, and then I worked my way up and 
saw the shape and I was like, okay, yeah, that's, that's different. That's unique. And that's, that's what they want to do. That's certainly what Franz, and I'm blanking on his last name, but the, the design lead housing. Yeah. For, 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 for Tesla he wants to make a dramatic statement, wants to make something that doesn't look like anything else. Um, and he succeeded. So I, I don't know in that sense, I guess it's a success, but as far as whether or not it's a pickup or not, it, it's, uh, it's not a pickup truck. In fact, when they talked to us, they, they called it the cyber pickup truck. It wasn't even called the cyber truck. And we said a pickup truck, I mean, that everybody knows what that is. It's not even a definition that can evolve or change. It's a engine and it's just like we talked about a passenger box and a bed in the back. And you've got none of those things on this one. You can't call it a pickup truck. It's call it a truck. A yeah, you can probably do that. Cyber truck probably makes more sense. But uh, but yeah, I mean, talking to their uh, design underlings and talking to Franz was an amazing experience to be able to interact with them and have them ask us questions and have us ask them questions. But it didn't take very long to figure out that, not surprisingly, they're not truck people. They're, in some cases, not even car people. Um, but but they're still doing amazing things there. I, I will say, when we do get a chance to look underneath that vehicle, and it, it's going to have to weigh eight or 9,000 pounds, it looks like, it, it reminded me of a Hummer H1 underneath with all the independent suspension, uh, heavy-duty protective gearing underneath uh, the front and the rear, underneath each wheel. Um, and everything just completely uh, sealed and bulletproof underneath as well, too. So that it's probably the most solid platform for any vehicle I've ever seen in my life. But I don't, I can't imagine it, it isn't going to weigh heavier than everything else in either the light duty or maybe even the heavy duty category. It seems to me like the kind of thing where if you fell into a coma and then woke up and then you saw the cyber truck and said, what's that? And somebody said, well, this is what pickup trucks look like now, you would think, oh, no, I've died and gone down. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. One more. One more. The Lordstown Endurance. Um, what's interesting about this one is that it has hub motors. So so the motors are at the wheels rather than um, a central motor. Um, 600 horsepower, 4,800 4, foot-pounds of torque, 8,000-pound towing, and a 5.5-foot bed. Um, they basically had had positioned this as being a contractor vehicle, um, so hmm. more more or less real truck. Um, Lordstown Motors has gone through all kinds of uh, issues in terms of financial things. Now Foxconn apparently is going to come in and build these things. Um, so is is this a real truck or is this something Tony Stark would buy? It looks like a real truck. I guess my question is, if there ain't a contractor, so if this thing breaks, where do you bring it? Yeah. Good point. <laughs> That's the first thing I would that would be on my mind as a contractor. Yeah. I can only assume that you've got spare electric hubs in the back seat, and it's got to be something that's very easy to take off, pull out, plug back in, put your wheel on, and you go. But it's That'd not going to be anything that you're going to be able to repair in the field. That that would be frightening. Mm -hmm. Look, now, the Endurance has been around for a long time, long, long time. In fact, I think I went to a, a work truck show either in Indianapolis or Kentucky or somewhere, maybe, maybe 10 years ago, maybe 12 years ago. Again, old guy talking about the past. But th that's when they first started talking about wanting to create this kind of uh, utility vehicle for fleet sales, which makes sense for electric vehicles. It doesn't make any sense to me to drive around like we do normally today. But if, but if you're a, a fleet buyer with fleet drivers that have a very standardized route that they go on every single day, and you know exactly how long it's going to take them and how many miles they're going to be driving, and you can bring them back to the main hub and you can plug them in every night, and, and have them all charged up for the next morning. That makes perfect sense to me, whether that's a postal service contract fleet to make a lot of money, or if that's to, you know, some of the big, uh, you know, municipalities or something like that as well, too. It seems like it could make sense. But, 
But when I, and when I see wheel hub technology, GM was showing us that 15 and 20 years ago that they had little S10s running around with wheel hub electric electric motors that didn't need to be on standard car platforms. Why am I looking at a pickup truck design when there's wheel hubs turning the wheels? It could be anything. You can have a roller skate platform, a skateboard platform and do anything on top of that, right? So why, how come I'm not looking at something really cool and unique and sexy and or practical and functional and I, I don't know. Yeah, there's just too many things that don't make sense to me when I look at what Lordstown's trying to show us now. So, so I guess if it, to wrap this up, I mean, it, it just basically seems to me that that the biggest hit of all of these forthcoming vehicles, I mean, the only one that's basically out there right now is is the Rivian 1RT. So, you know, props to them for being the first to market. But it sounds like the Bollinger B2, if you guys <laughs> win the lottery. Oh, man. You you will each have one of those. That would be put up. Yes, in in your sure. garage. And, and I don't mean to be the the naysayer that I don't believe this is going to happen. Scott was very polite about reminding me that obviously there's pre-orders and there's a lot of excitement about something like the F one fifty Lightning. It's a redefinition, a recreation of something familiar to a lot of us old guys. But but where this fits in the heart of the market and meets the needs of your average typical pickup truck buyer, I think we're still a long way away from general adoption in this segment. So Rainer, are, are you a big fan of the notion of electric pickup trucks or? Uh, is, is... I mean, the things that concern me are about the battery, the fact that you're going to buy this thing and every year the range decreases seems a little odd to me. Um, I think they haven't really figured out the battery recycling, what the economic impact of that's going to be, and then sourcing the batteries. Are we going to be basically driving around on these blood diamond powered vehicles? Um, and I think it makes good electric trucks make good sense for a suburban environment where you've got a garage you can plug into. They're going to be a lot harder in a city unless you're very rich and you live in a building with a parking garage that has charging stations, which is not most people. Um, and then in the country, I think there's going to be some some range anxiety. Um, and, uh, you know, like Mark mentioned, a lot of the times you're carrying heavy stuff and that reduces the range. Right. So I think if it's going to take off, it's going to be in the suburbs. That's my guess. Hmm. Uh, which I think um, 52% of American households are in the suburbs, 21% rural, 27% urban from like an American housing survey. So, so that's a good chunk of the market. So the suburbs where, where people really need to pick up truck to do their, uh... <laughs> it's going to become a lifestyle object. I mean, in, in that context. Uh huh. All right. So we're going to wrap it up there. Mark Williams, thank you for joining us once again. You're our go-to guy when I got trucks on. <laughs> Rain, no, Core 7 7. Thank you for being back. Your insights on the design and your Absolutely. truck ownership and experience is, is very helpful. So, I want to ask, uh, thank everybody for joining us. Um, come back next week and we're going to do another one of these. So, have a good day. Thank you, Gary. Appreciate thank you, it. Gary. Thank you, Rain. Hey, thanks, Mark. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey, and by Magna. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv.